Acts 17, 1 through 15. When Paul and Silas had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to the Jews, and on three Sabbath days he led them in a discussion from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. He also said, This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great number of God-fearing Greeks and more than a few of the prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and gathered from the marketplace some wicked men who formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house and searched for Paul and Cyrus in order to bring them out to the mob. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men, who have stirred up trouble all over the world, have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them as guests. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The crowd and the city officials were stirred up when they heard these things, they took a security bond from Jason and the others and let them go. That same night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. They received the word very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see if their these things were so. Many of them believed, along with more than a few prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica heard that the word of God was being proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they also went there to agitate and stir up the crowd. Then the brothers immediately sent, Saul, sent Paul away to the seacoast, but Silas and Timothy stayed there. Those who escorted Paul brought him all the way to Athens. When they left, they received instructions from Silas and Timothy to join Paul as soon as possible. 2 Peter 2, 4-10 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The Gospel for the fifth Sunday of Easter is John 14. 1 through 12. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. 
If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that Jesus spoke to us about how it is that we can be in fellowship with you, how it is that our sins can be forgiven and we can be reconciled, how it is that we can have life. So we ask now that as we meditate in your word, you will open it to our understanding, that you will continue to give us faith, that we would put our trust in Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This portion of John's Gospel, beginning of chapter 14, begins with the words, Let not your hearts be troubled. And when I read that, I want to know what the context is. What had just happened that would cause the disciples' hearts to be troubled so that Jesus would give them this teaching about how it is that we can be with the Father. We looked at pieces of John 13 on Monday, Thursday, as Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He washed their feet as he called them to serve one another. At the end of the meal, or towards the end of the meal, Jesus told the disciples that one of them would betray him. They didn't understand what that was all about, and as we read the account, we, we find that uh, Judas left the meal Jesus having told him to go and do what he needed to do. And John's comment at the time was that they didn't know what Judas was going to do. They had guessed that perhaps since he was the treasurer that he was going to go pay for the meal or whatever it is that the treasurer would do. But Jesus did announce his betrayal. And then he told the disciples that the time had come for him to be glorified and that he would be leaving them. And so then we find at the end of chapter 13, Peter reacting to Jesus' declaration that he would be leaving them. And the question that he asked was, where are you going? And so that's the context then, that's the setting in which we 
move into chapter 14. The disciples had just celebrated the Passover with Jesus. They had been told that he was going to be betrayed. Jesus had said to them that he was leaving and left them with a question. Where's he going? And so it's in that context that Jesus told them that their hearts should not be troubled. And then he gave them the reason why they should not have troubled hearts. As he continued to explain to them his glorification and his leaving. The first thing he, he says to them, he assures them that the reason that their hearts don't need to be troubled is because of the faith relationship they can have with God. Believe in God, he said to them. Believe in me. And as we work through this conversation that Jesus had with the disciples, we recognize that John that Jesus, as John records for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that Jesus connected himself with the Father. So that when he said here, believe in God, believe also in me, he is not saying that there are two separate deities that we place our trust in, but that he is the God that we are to believe in, in whom we are to place our trust, and that our placing our trust in them is what will help us not have troubled hearts. And so then he, he told them that he was going, well, he, it's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. If it were not so, you know, or, or the first the reality that in the Father's house there are many rooms, and if that were not the case, would Jesus have told them that he was going to prepare a place for them? So he tells them that he is going to the Father's house to prepare a place for them. And that when that place is ready, he will return to get them. Now, there's a little interesting aside here that uh, this is Jewish marriage imagery. As we consider that the church, that we, the church, are the bride of Christ, and that when he returns to get us and take us back to his father's home, it will be for the marriage feast of the Lamb. So here's that little aside in, in, in a glimpse in, into how the marriage ceremonies of the days of Jesus are used to show us about the church. In those days, when a man was betrothed to his bride, he went back to his father's house and added a room on. And she went back to her parents and waited and watched. It would not be announced to her when he would come and get her, but when the room was ready, when the new dwelling place for the bride and groom were ready, he would go to her home. There would be a little ceremony there, and then there would be a procession from her home to his. And then they would have the great wedding feast, and that is the picture that is painted for us about us and the times to come. That our hearts do not need to be troubled because our groom is at the Father's house preparing the rooms where we will live. And when those rooms are ready, the groom will come back and take us there with him. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house, and I will return to take you there. And then he told his disciples that they would know that they already knew 
the way to get there. And you know the way that I am going. Now, this is confusing to the disciples. They're, they don't understand what he's talking about, and I suppose we can't be hard on them. If we were there, our reaction would probably very likely be the same. And yet, we see him here when he says, you know the way where I am going. He is foreshadowing what he is going to reveal about himself, that because they know him, they know the way to the Father. But let's step back to that conversation, a conversation that likely happened as Jesus was walking from the, the upper room, the guest room, where they had the Passover meal, out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Thomas asked him, or first makes a question, makes a statement. We don't know where you're going. So if we don't know where you're going, then the question, how can we know the way? But there's a presupposition in Thomas' question and, or statement and question. Thomas' reaction to Jesus' declaration that he is leaving them, that they know the way to get there, shows us that being where Jesus is, is good and desirable. That that is the yearning that God has placed into our hearts that we would be reconciled to God, that we would be right with God, that we would yearn for and hope for and desire to be with Jesus, that we, the bride of Christ, desire to be with our groom. And so being with Jesus is a good and desirable thing and it ought to be our desire. And so Jesus then revealed to Thomas how that could be possible with the words, I am. Now there are three things that he says he is here, but core to his proclamation of his identity is that I am, that I am statement that ties us back to God speaking to Moses in the wilderness at the bush that could not be consumed by the fire of God. Not could not be, but was not, because God is a living fire. The I am who spoke to Moses and said, I am who I am. Jesus now says, I am. And he says, I am the way. So if you know Jesus, he is saying to his disciples, and he says it to us also now, if you know me, you know the way, because I am the way. I am the truth. Just a few hours later, maybe the next morning, Pilate would ask Jesus, what is truth? God has revealed truth to us through the living word Jesus and in the written word, the Holy Bible, truth. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, Jesus is the life. And it is only in his life and him giving us his life as he takes upon himself our death that we can live. And it is then through Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, that we can get to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me, he said. And so while the claim is universal, it is also very specific. It is for everyone but the everyone who would be saved must go through Jesus, who gave himself on the cross to give us
Peter commented on the meaning of what Jesus did for us. Remember these words in John are spoken as Jesus is going out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He would be arrested there. The next morning he would be tried. The next afternoon he would be crucified. And Peter is reflecting on that and its application to us in our second lesson, 1 Peter 2, where he affirms to us that we are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house. We are like living stones because we have come to Jesus, the living stone who was rejected by men, but in the sight of God was chosen and precious. And so then, as we come to Jesus, as we come to the way and the truth and the life, as we come through Jesus to the Father, we are like living stones, and we are being built up as a spiritual house, but then also to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then we have these beautiful words from 2 Peter 2.9 that point us to who we are in Christ and what it is Christ has called us to do in Him. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession that so that, here's the purpose, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We wait for the return of our groom. We wait knowing that he is preparing a place for us and will return to gather us there. We wait knowing that He is the way and the truth and the life. We do not have to live in this waiting with troubled hearts. Because as we have been brought to Jesus, He has made us into a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession. He has taken us out of darkness into his marvelous light that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for such a great gift. We thank you that you were willing to go to the cross to take upon yourself our death the punishment we deserve for our breaking the law, for our rebellion. And that in that great exchange, you give us life. You call us to be yours. And you commission us to proclaim the excellencies, your excellencies. We thank you, and we pray that you would continue to give us the faith to believe. We ask in your precious name.